Hi, welcome to Swarovski Optic. Unfortunately, I can't be in Kali this year, but we're here. It's winter time, and I'm gonna be going into our little studio talking to you about birds and birders. So, I like birds. I also like people, most people. Now, most talks at bird fairs, bird congresses are going to be about birds. Today, I'm going to talk about us, about birders. We're going to do a bit of birder watching. As a child, I grew up in nature. I loved spending time in streams, running through the savannas. I planted lots of plants, trees, and caught frogs. And at some stage, I discovered birds. My dad got a pair of binoculars for Christmas, and that was super exciting. We could really dive into this whole bird world. Unfortunately for my dad, he didn't have very much time with his binoculars because he always had the competition from the rest of the family wanting to use the binoculars. Later on, we got more pairs of binoculars. My parents were wonderful in supporting us, going out to nature parks, going out to national parks, looking at wildlife, watching birds, discovering the world. And this story might sound familiar to some of you. Maybe you also grew up in a family environment with people who were interested in nature and birds. Or maybe you had a different experience. Maybe you discovered birds as an adult. You had a spark bird at your feeder looked out one day and there was a goldfinch there or something special. Or maybe you were at university and you were studying biology and you slowly slid into the world of birds and other wildlife. And this diversity of how we get into birds is, I find that really fascinating. What is a bird, though? And I suppose as a, as a child, this is a very it seemed like a very simple question. Well, it was somebody who liked birds. Well, of course, it's somebody who liked birds. But in English, we've got these confusing definitions. We've got, uh, or these confusing terms. We've got a, a birder. There's also a bird watcher. What's the difference? And most people use birder and bird watcher quite interchangeably. But I tend to see something of a, within the gray, there are some extremes. And a birder I kind of see as somebody who is a little bit more intense and looking for birds, trying to find more species. They're going out there and they're going to new places and they're trying to find new stuff. They're kind of like the Pokemon Go players of the wildlife world. Whereas a bird watcher, they're a little bit more passive on the passive side, like allowing nature to unfold around them being one with what's around them. <laughs> and then we've got the, the ornithologists, the scientists. And an ornithologist is somebody who studies birds and they're asking specific questions. They might be looking at the biogeography of species or the behavior of species or conservation biology. They might be a geneticist looking at how they're related and there are many ornithologists who aren't birders in the classic sense. They don't necessarily go out looking for more species. Now, we were trying to understand how many birders there were. And in order to do this, you first have to come up with a definition of what a birder is. And so we came up with a, an, an overly narrow definition. Because we started off with saying, well, a birder is somebody who uses binoculars or a spotting scope and uses those to watch birds. That makes sense. Came out with a huge number, as you would expect. And so we thought, well, how do we make this even narrower? Well, let's say people who go out many times in a month, several times in a month. So not just once a month, but they're going out several times a month to, to look for birds. Still, we got a huge number. We thought, well, how can we make this a little bit narrower? We said, well, people who think it's important to identify every bird that they see, they're really trying to identify everything. That's a really tight definition now. But still, 
in the study that we did, we did a study in 18 countries. It kind of, you can imagine it uh, like po a polling study for elections where you're asking tens of thousands of people and trying to get an idea of, of what their interests were. And we asked them tons of questions. And out of that, we still got a huge number of birders from these 18 countries. We got an estimated 25 million birders. That is a lot of birders and way more than I ever would have expected. And I suppose one of the things that we learned from the detailed questions was that these birders aren't necessarily the in the community of bird people that I hang out with. They've got their own communities and their own ways of discovering birds and interacting with birds. Unsurprisingly, birders are about 50-50 male-female in Europe. And in North America, there are even more women birders than, than men. In terms of age, there are birders in every age. Now, we've got in this graph, we've got fewer who are below 25 and fewer who are in their uh, like above 70, above 75. And that's, that's something to do with the sampling, how we sampled. But what we are seeing is that there's a very steady amount of, of, of birders through all ages. That's actually, it was actually quite nice to discover. But what about people who are watching birds in their garden? Are, are they a birder? Well, certainly not in that overly tight dis uh, definition we gave before. But I suppose even in, in a broad sense, I would, they wouldn't classically be counted as a birder. But having said that, I just love people who, who enjoy nature, who find beauty in nature, who like going outdoors. One of the other things that we discovered when we spoke to those tens of thousands of people was that many of them were into photography. In fact, for 69% of them, they were really into taking photos. And most of them, it would be just taking photos for their own use. But some of them now get more social media is becoming more and more important. They're posting stuff for their family and friends on social media. And there's a growing group of people who are taking photos professionally. Along this line, our tropical birding did a study a couple of years ago, which I think is really interesting. They looked at, they asked thousands and thousands of people online, mostly their customers, but also other people, where their interests lay. And so there's this complicated triangle, but you can imagine the dots at the top are people who are really into bird watching. They're wanting to see new species. Bottom left, they're really into taking photos. That's their primary purpose. Bottom right, into general wildlife. Somebody in the middle, their interests are bird watching, equally bird watching, photography, and wildlife. One of the really interesting things that they found was that they, they also asked people where their interests lay 10 years ago and where they are now. And what we see there is a, is a significant change. Lots of people who are really into bird watching and species before have shifted towards photography. Photography has become more important in the last decade. And lots of people who were classically into photography have shifted more towards bird watching. They've been drawn into bird watching. Another interesting tale that tropical birding told coming uh, out of the study was that. For example, their Madagascar trips in the past, they would be looking for all of the Madagascan endemic birds. And now as photography has risen, there's been an equal growth in interest in other things. And so looking at the cool geckos, looking for chameleons and taking photos of the chameleons and the lemurs. So it seems that this photography is also helped foster a growth in, in general wildlife interest. Now that generalist interest in wildlife, 
apart from just birds, is something that we actually see across the board with birders. Now, 90% of people who are classically birders in that really tight definition, they're also interested in other wildlife. They're looking at frogs, like poison dart frogs, really cool, or zebras or other wildlife. Now, uh, just at the end of last year, I went on a trip with a bunch of friends and we went racing around Costa Rica and it was a great, I mean, wonderful friends, wonderful fun. We saw a lot of birds. I, I saw or recorded 441 species of bird in just over a week and a bunch of different monkeys and cool frogs and fantastic time. And as you do at the end of a trip, we asked each other like, well, what was the best bird or experience of the trip? And everybody had different stories. The, I must say that the unspotted saw-wet owl experience with Parson and Ernesto and Volcan Erezo was really stood out as something that was special for, for most people. But then there were also stories of like Jabaroos or Agami herons, and everybody had their own special moments. But when I reflected myself, it was, it was definitely spending time in the lowland tropical forests in, um, in the southwest, like Peninsula de Osa, or in, uh, in Puerto Viejo de Sarapequi, like lowland tropical forests there, I just come alive, and I found that beautiful. But these discussions really made it clear to me how we can, we were a group of very intense birders, but even within our group, we saw birding in different ways, and we get different things from it. And different things kind of excited us in different ways. And I thought that that was fascinating. In the study that we had done, we asked people what their most important reason was why, why they went out birding. Like, what, what was most important to them? And actually, the, the, most, the, the element that came out strongest was spending quiet time in nature. Uh, that really resonates with me, just being out in nature, smelling nature. You're out there birding, but just letting nature soak into you. Taking photos is also really important to a lot of people, as is obviously seeing new birds. Spending time with friends and like-minded people was very important to lots of people. But I'm going to pick up a one element here, this exploring new places. For a huge number of people, birding has become a kind of a reason why they travel and a way that they discover the planet. And so for 57% of our, of our birders, they really enjoy discovering the world through birding. And so they're traveling outside of their states. And maybe they're going to a national park. Many people are traveling to neighboring countries or globally. And I must say that I really love international wildlife travel. I, re I, I just, it's very important to me. I love seeing new species, new landscapes, being exposed to different cultures, eating different foods, trying different things. And this COVID time now has really made that very clear to me how important travel is to me as, as a person. And I know many of my friends reflect that as well, that they really struggled not being able to travel and not being able to have this diversity of experiences. But of course, whenever you're talking about international travel, the question of CO2 has to come up. We live in a reality where climate change is all around us and it's affecting our planet. It's affecting the species that I am very passionate about and that we all care about. And so we need to be thinking about our responsibility within this realm. We really need to be conserving at least 30% of the planet by 2030. This is the only way we're going to be able to mitigate some of 
the enormous changes that we're putting on the planet before it gets too late. This is incredibly important. And all of us can play a role in supporting this goal of 30% conservation by 2030. There are tons of great conservation organizations out there really dedicated to fulfilling this goal, to protecting the planet. Here are just a few examples, but there are really lots of people and organizations out there working really hard to save the planet. And this is really important because, well, in 1970, there were a lot of animals out there. And if we, uh, there was a, a great consortium of, of organizations that led by the WWF who were looking at species populations, specifically of vertebrates. So we're talking mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish. And shockingly, populations of monitored populations of these vertebrates are now 68% lower than they were in 1970. Said another way around, that means in 1970, there were three times as many vertebrates as there are now. Our world is crumbling. This is important. And I'm going to take this back. Like, what's this got to do with, uh, with us and travel? Well, the thing is that during the COVID time, suddenly travel stopped. Wildlife travel just couldn't happen. And there are millions of people around the world who work in ecotourism, who work in wildlife tourism, and suddenly it stopped. And these people were then forced to try and find ways to sustain their families. They lost their jobs. They need to sustain their livelihood. And unfortunately, poaching went through the roof in many places. Illegal logging has gone through the roof. And these people who have now lost their livelihoods and entire communities are now faced with the very clear reality of needing to find another way of living. And so you might have wondered why earlier on I spoke about carbon dioxide and international travel, but didn't speak about not traveling. Well, that's because if we just play the hypothetical game that if we stop wildlife tourism, international wildlife tourism travel, that might have an effect on CO2. Well, it will. But it might have an unintended effect and a huge unintended effect on biodiversity. And so stopping wildlife travel or slowing it down is going to be very, very dangerous. Without wildlife tourism, species like mountain gorillas, tigers, or even amazing places like the Masai Mara, they're going to be having a hard time. We were wondering what other effects COVID had on the planet. And one of the incredible things that we saw was, or well, we looked at Google search terms, you can actually see how many people are searching different terms. And so we looked at, at the word birds in various different languages, so pájaros, aves, uh, fergal, uh, in multiple languages. And what we looked at is how that growth and how many people were searching those terms, just as an indicator. And what we saw was that there was a 69% increase in Europe of people searching for the word birds and about a 40% increase in the Americas. And this is just another reflection on this growing interest in nature that we're seeing all around us during this COVID age. People are discovering nature and they're getting out there and they're enjoying nature. People are discovering birds and wildlife and they're caring for that. And what I suspect is that people are still nervous about traveling. They're still nervous about traveling further away. But as the 
as that starts to settle, we're going to see people being more interested in discovering wild places and other um, in other realms and discovering the world through the eyes of nature in ways that they might not have done before. Maybe before they were doing more city travel or more cultural travel. But I really see that that wildlife travel is going to boom over the next decade. I suspect that people are also going to change how they travel. Potentially smaller groups that are wanting to be in small, like around fewer people, less in cities, smaller lodges, more by themselves. And just to round it off, I here's a picture of the Amazon. It's just one of my favorite places. This is the the Colombian Amazon. It's it's flooded vast air and. I really find myself, I find so much inspiration and beauty going out and birding, being in nature, being able to help, uh, being able to just soak that up. And I love to see the, not only the diversity of nature, but also the diversity of people and the diversity of people who are interested in nature and getting out there and thinking about our world and our planet and the effect that we're having on it and thinking about how we can have a real effect on saving the planet and really working towards that goal of a 30% conserved and protected by 2030. So I'll ask you, go out there, go birding, have fun, watch other birders, and enjoy other people watching birds and enjoying birds.